Hi, welcome. I'm Jane Mayer. I'm a staff writer for The New Yorker. And on behalf of the magazine, I'm very happy to welcome all of you to the 2011 New Yorker Festival and today's event, which is a conversation with Nancy Pelosi. Uh, before introducing our distinguished guest, I want to remind all of you in the audience, turn off your cell phones. I think I just heard some little electronic sound. Um, no photography is allowed. And if you're planning to use Twitter following the event, please use the hashtag TNYFest. Uh, the event today will last 90 minutes and include at least a half an hour or so of questions from you, the audience. Um, when you do ask questions, um, please make sure that they're actually questions, not statements. Um, so I'm very, very honored today to be able to introduce Nancy Pelosi. Uh, it's not every day that you get to talk with someone whose official title on second reference is leader. It's a title that anyone familiar with Nancy Pelosi's career knows that she has earned. In 2007, she shattered what she called the marble ceiling in Washington and became the first woman speaker of the House of Representatives in American history. Few of us who witnessed the moment will ever forget the sight of her up at the podium surrounded by a swarm of children, her own grandchildren, and pretty much every other small person who scampered in the entire capital. Um, as she announced that from that day on, for girls, all over the country, the sky was the limit. I made sure my own daughter, who was 10 at the time, witnessed the moment on TV. She's since become the youngest paid staffer in the House of Representatives, so maybe it helped change her and give her some big plans and many other kids too, I hope. As uh, Speaker, Nancy Pelosi led the House in enacting almost all of President Obama's ambitious agenda, including comprehensive health care legislation and action on climate change, only to see some of it unravel in the Senate and herself become vilified. In 2010, she survived a $75 million Republican campaign of attack ads, many of them aimed at demonizing her, with her hair and her smile still intact. Uh, the Democrats lost control of the House in a searing midterm defeat, and Pelosi's now the House Minority Leader, and she continues to represent California's 8th Congressional District. they have burlesque music when you have get undressed on stage. I don't know. Uh, anyway, um, please join me in welcoming Nancy Pelosi. Thank you so much for coming here today. My pleasure. Us. I understand that um, New York City actually played some part in your life. You lived here at some point, is that right? Yes, I did. Well, first of all, thank you, Jane, for your kind words of welcome. It's fun to be here for the New Yorker Festival. I'm trying to find the clue to how I can get the winning caption on the cartoon. <laughs> so far, not so good. I haven't even had the courage to send one in. Uh, yes, I have the privilege of representing San Francisco the 8th Congressional District in the Congress of the United States. That. But Fancy. before we, my husband and I moved for him, he was born and raised in San Francisco, but as newlyweds, uh, we lived in Manhattan. Four of our five children were born in Manhattan, and uh, we love it. And just when you get off that plane and feel that adrenaline coming up the street. When, when he had this incredible job offer to go home for him at the time of the... Uh, the whole technological boom and all of that on set, I said, well, I would only go with the idea that we would keep our New York apartment and <laughs> we'd get the New York Times every day. Yes. E <laughs> easier now than then. We got it like, like Thursday for Sunday and stuff. But, um, and we try to keep our apartment until they said, owner, occupancy, primary residence, we were out. Um, but we tried to hold on as long as we could. Now one of my daughters, the only one, the fifth child, Alexandra, 
She wasn't born in New York, but she's the only one who lives in New York with her, her husband and our beautiful grandchildren. So all the more reason I love New York. Well, welcome home. Okay. <laughs> sort of home. Um, um, I thought that I would start by just sort of bringing us all back to the moment where it was uh, January 2009. The Democrats had a solid majority in the House, mm -hmm. in the Senate. We had a a uh, bright young new president who had broken racial barriers and there was it's just it seemed like everything was going um, the democratic way and all things seemed possible. So what happened? <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened had happened. Uh, when the president took office, he inherited, volunteered for it, uh, uh, a, an economy that we had just witnessed uh, in that fall before, in, in September, uh, a meltdown, a financial crisis of glo global magnitude. Uh, we, we knew we were in a deep recession, almost bordering on a depression. All of that contributed to deep, uh, deep deficits. Uh, the president um, uh, understood the challenge he had, so did we, uh, but it, it was much, much deeper and harder to come out of. If the president had not acted upon a recovery package and other federal initiatives, it would have been a, a worse situation. But nobody wants to hear about that. They want to hear about how things will get better. And so in 2010 election, with still 9.5% unemployment, that is a screen you really can't get past. But nonetheless, we're on a path that, that uh, hopefully will bring people together. It's very hard. It's very hard when people don't have jobs, when their homes are in jeopardy, when, uh, when their pensions are in doubt, where the education of their children is in question. Uh, that, that obviously, uh, it's not a great motivator to say, I want more of the same. Well, I've, 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 I have to say, I've often wondered, since it does seem that, um, that Obama inherited so many difficult problems from the Bush years, and I remember reading that, I guess in 2008, you'd said, uh, I think, to Bush, that, you know, you've left us, you've left Congress to clean up all the messes you've left behind. And what I wonder is, is there a statute of limitations in politics for how long you can Blame Bush, um, even, if it's, even if it's fair to blame him, is there a certain point? Um, I noticed that, that Vice President Biden was just saying, you know, it's our economy now. Um, is it, is it, is, are the Democrats now being blamed, or is there any way to remind people of Bush, or is it just a losing bet in politics to say, actually, where did this come from? Well, uh, let's put it this way. When President Reagan was president, he was president for eight years. And for eight years, he blamed President Carter, who was president for four <laughs> years. <laughs> but the fact is, is that uh, I think this president, when he came into office, uh, uh, could have been clearer about the depth of the problem that we had. But the professional that he is, he was, no, we just have to go forward. But you have to recognize how you got where you are, what the depth of the problem is, so you don't repeat those same mistakes. But as you say, okay, we're there now, let's go forward, let's get a job done. Mm -hmm. And nobody expects it to be magical, go from one day to the next, but they do expect it to be progress. progress. And well, that's what we have to. St. Ther um, Teresa, Mother Teresa, have some, a little framed saying of her. She said, God does not always expect us to be successful, but he always expects us to be faithful. So we have to be faithful and make progress on what we are doing. But you can't say, I, I don't think you can free yourself and say uh, uh, that we want to make a differentiation between what happened before and where we go. You see people down on Wall Street, uh, they believe that recklessness of many on Wall Street, let's not paint everyone with the same brush, but the recklessness of some on Wall Street caused massive joblessness on Main Street. They don't want to see it happen again. So again, the, the uh, assigning of blame is one thing. You have to move from it, but you also have to learn from it. Do you think, in retrospect, that, um, that Obama made the right choice in putting the health care legislation at the top of his agenda? 
I know there was internal discussion in the White House. Mm. I think David Axelrod even thought that he should put economic issues and particularly jobs ahead of the health care um, uh, legislation as the sort of number one priority. Um, I wonder if, if in, in, you know, at the time, did it seem the right thing to you to do health care first? And in retrospect, does it s seem the right thing to do? Absolutely, the right thing to do. For the, let me, I, I, with all due respect for David Ap Axelrod, from the standpoint of those who had the responsibility to get the job done, uh, the president stood on the steps of the Capitol, you know, January 20th, 2009. He said, I want swift, bold action now on jobs and education for the 21st century, trained workforce, uh, clean energy jobs. You know the beautiful presentation he made. One week and one day, one week and one day from his speech, the House passed the, the uh, Recovery Act, the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, which not by our statistics, but by others who measure them, saved or created millions of jobs. We needed more, but at least it took us to a, a, a direction of progress. Uh, the President, 100 days from his speech, the House and the Senate on the very same day, this is remarkable in itself, that we went on the same day, uh, pass a bill that was the President's budget. It was a statement of values. It was a statement to stabilize the economy, uh, to uh, reduce taxes on the middle class, to lower the deficit, to create jobs based on three pillars. Investments in education and innovation is one. All innovation begins in the classroom. Investments in energy and, and energy security and independence and investments in health care. These were all jobs bills. The health care bill will create 4 million jobs. If we had passed the energy bill, it would have been 2 million, even though some of them are being created from other actions taken, even though we didn't pass that bill. The education bill is the biggest bill for higher education in the history of our country, even, even eclipsing uh, the um, uh, GI Bill of decades earlier. So these were jobs bills. The issue was why not describe them that way, mm -hmm. but the fact is you have to create jobs around something, not out of thin air, but out of initiatives that grow the economy and uh, make investments, use the tax code, uh, set standards that take us forward. Uh, but I think that all of us would never, never say we would rather not have passed health care for all Americans as a right, not a privilege, where being a woman is no longer pre-existing medical condition. <laughs> well, I could go on and on if you want to go on that. <clears throat> Well, yeah, I, I suppose, I mean, I, what I wonder is it was an incredible push on, on your part, really. You, you really made this happen in many ways. And I, 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 I look out there, and I've just been down in North Carolina, and it's as if, you know, they, Obamacare has become like a dirty word out there. Why is it, in your view, why is it not seen as more of a plus? Is there something more the White House or yes. Democrats could do yes. to make it actually appreciated? Yes, well, the fact is, is that when we decided to go down this path to do the health care reform, when it was the president's agenda and something that for decades, actually when Social Security was passed, the hope was that there would be health care attached to it. It wasn't. When Medicare was passed, that it would be broader, but it wasn't. So this is the third leg of a three-legged stool. Social Security, Medicare, health care for all Americans. If there were no other reason to do health care reform, the compelling reason was we could not sustain or afford the current system. Individuals couldn't, families couldn't, businesses couldn't, our economy can't, the federal budget couldn't, our businesses that compete internationally had this anvil of cost that we had to lower. So again, to have a healthier America was our vision. To have a, a containment of cost was a necessity as well. So this was a bill about innovation, it's about prevention, it's about wellness. Again, about he good health as well as <clears throat> good health care. When we started to go into it, we knew. We said, this is going, we're going to get attacked so badly from the special interest who love the status quo, who are milking the system of resources, holding the American people hostage with their rescissions of care and time of 
of uh, uh, surgery and that. So it's going to be carpet bombing. It's going to be take no prisoners, scorched earth policy. You got any more? You know the point. They're going to come <laughs> major because it's about big money. Big money. And uh, so it was, we were going forth with it's about innovation, prevention, wellness, uh, non-discrimination against women, people with pre-existing medical conditions, you name it. They're going forth with death panels, abortion, which it really wasn't about, those kinds of things. And they had endless money and, and again, accompanied by those who are opposed to government, and we can talk about that in a moment as well, any government role in any initiative of this kind, the same people who want to privatize Social Security and make a voucher of Medicare. So it's a philosophical but also a money issue. And they, since we didn't have a bill while the Senate was working on it, they could characterize it any way they want. But the fact is the bill passed, it's the law of the land, it's, going to be, it's great for our country in job creation, but central to it all is that uh, the American people have a fair shot to, to be, have life, li health, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, a healthy life, the freedom to pursue, the liberty to pursue their happiness because they're not job locked. They're not constrained if a child has a pre-existing condition, diabetes, bipolar, uh, they're not constrained in case someone gets sick in their families. So they could be a writer, a, a photographer, an artist, a singer. They could start their own business. They could change jobs. They could be self-employed, whatever. And healthcare uh, is not a constraint on that vitality in our economy, over and above the overriding principle of, of, of good health. Uh, for all Americans. So it's a, a, I'll tell you this one story. When, because you, you mentioned how hard it was to pass it. Tell me if this is more on the, than you want to know, because we can move on. <laughs> so when we were doing the bill with all of these characterizations from the dark side that were coming, <laughs> may I be honest with you this morning, <laughs> this <laughs> afternoon? <laughs> um, the, uh, the press came to me and they said, how do you expect to pass this bill? It, it, we had, the Democrats had just lost the Senate seat in Massachusetts. Now we don't have 60 votes anymore. How do you expect to pass this bill? Well, putting it back into the perspective, this is our opportunity of a generation. If we don't do it now, it's not going to happen for 30 years. If then, who knows? And what our responsibility was, I said, well, we're just going to pass it. We're going in the, how are you going to pass it? Well, we're going to go up to the fence. That would be a barrier to our passage. We're going to go up to the fence. We're going to push open the gate. If the gate doesn't open, we're going to climb the fence. The fence is too high, we're going to pole vault in. <laughs> if that doesn't work, we're going to parachute in. <laughs> but we're not letting anything stand in the way of health care for all Americans as they write, not a privilege for the few. We pass the bill. <laughs> well, can I wait? No, and then they say, the press says, mm -hmm. which one did you do? <laughs> so I said, well, actually, and we walked up to the gate and we pushed it open. 220 of us strong pushed it open. But we knew then, and we always will know, that we were not alone. It was the urgency of the issue that the American people knew. It was the mobilization of so many people outside of the Congress and across the country. Thank God for the nuns. The nuns were big help pushing that <laughs> gate open up against other odds. And, um, uh, and that's how we got it open. Did you personally organize the nuns? Oh, and the nuns are very well organized now. Own. Okay, yeah. just no, wondered. The nuns pray for us, but they do their own organizing. Well, <laughs> I, I have to say, I have often wondered what do you do to cajole these votes and get them moving your way? And I've I read that you use your mother of five voice 
And um, I've also read a quote from you at some point that said, when people are ripping your face off, you have to get and rip their face off. Oh, so did I say that? I, <laughs> I thought it, but I didn't know I said it. <laughs> uh, so I, I kind of like to hear the mother of five boys, but... Um, well, I, when I said the mother of five boys, I was referring to, you can hear me in the back row, they were taking it to mean something of sternness. I would never be stern with my members. But, <laughs> <laughs> Why but am I wondering? It is, um, it is a, 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 we built consensus. We worked together to put the, the bill together. In fact, we had three committees that had hearings and hearings and hearings, and we accepted many, many, many Republican amendments. They like to forget that because they didn't want to be for the bill in any event. Uh, but it's a, it's a, uh, Jane, it's like a, weaving a very finely uh, woven fabric. Every member brings something very unique and special and strong to that building of consensus. And so you have to build it in a way that isn't, that won't fray, that is there through all the attacks and assaults on the bill that will come. But you can't, it's not something you deign from here, this is what it's going to be. It's something you all work together. This is what would work in our region. Our country is very diverse. But it, uh, it also was the leadership of President Barack Obama. In fact, the day after the bill passed in the House, he called me and said, Last night when the bill passed, I was happier than I was the night I was elected President of the United States. Oh. <laughs> I remember reading he had a martini, I think. That I don't house. know. That I don't know about that. <laughs> but, well, but I said, Mr. President, I was pretty happy last night, yeah. too. But I wasn't happier than the night you were elected President of the United States. <laughs> because if you weren't elected President of the United States, we wouldn't have had the success that we had last night. We simply could not have done it without him. But as I say to all of the people who care about health care reform, when I speak to them, we could not have done it without him, but we could not have done it without all of you as well. So I say to them, take some level of pride and satisfaction in the role you played, because the inside maneuvering is one side thing. The outside mobilization is essential to getting really getting a good job done. And I think that as you know, we've just seen the figures um, over two million young people are now on their families' policies. Since last year, children uh, are no longer uh, discriminated against in terms of health care because of a pre-existing medical condition. Um, millions of people in our country now have access to preventive care with no copay uh, and, and, and the like. And uh, our seniors certainly are beginning to see the advantage of uh, lower prices for pharmaceutical companies, but that will that, that is an unfolding part of it, and in a couple of years, of course, the whole bill will set in. So I have great pride in what, it, it, what we did. Uh, the people will begin to feel the impact of it. If you don't think there should be a government role, you will never like this. But this is a, a, a government standard that encourages the private sector, private exchanges, and the rest. Again, we're really very, very proud of it. So. Thank you. um, you've mentioned now President Obama and his help in that, and um, which brings up, I think, a question that everybody probably has on their mind, which is um, what the relationship is like um, between you and President Obama. Um, the, um, there have been a number of books that have come out that have described him as, is, is, as somewhat aloof as a person. Um, and maybe a little isolated, generally surrounding himself with a, a few close people that he's comfortable with. And, um, and some of the books have described the relationship between you and him as, as somewhat difficult. Um, there was one, um, I think there was a scene in a book by Richard Wolff in which uh, he, you were tr trying to explain to President Obama that he should not give up the Democrats' um, complete defense of Social Security and making this point so strongly to him that he finally said something like, I am not a stupid man. Um, and so I don't know if this really happened. I was curious. No, you don't remember this? I don't okay. remember that. Okay, but is he, no. how is he about taking advice? How is he in the, you know, does, does he ask advice? Does he take advice? Is he warm? How is he to deal with? You want to talk about the president now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> the president is... Uh, let, let me say what my standards are for leadership. You tell me what you think. 
I always say to people when they want to lead or run for office or whatever, or class president, what is your vision? What is your goal? What do you, why do you want to do this? What do you know about the subject? And therefore, what is your judgment? Do you have a strategic plan to get this done? And can you convey that to other people? Barack, President Barack Obama scores A++ on every score. He has a vision about taking our country in a, a fresh new direction where many more people are transformed in their thinking about what their possibilities are. He knows the issues. He's not been around Washington that long, but he's brilliant, and that saves time. <laughs> that saves time. It's a quick study. And maybe not being there long is, is a plus. We have to assume it is, because he, you know, he's extremely knowledgeable, knows his vision, therefore his judgment is geared in that direction. He's a strategic thinker about how to get something done, and I don't have to speak to you about his eloquence about convincing other people. Uh, so when you ask, he's the president of the United States. Uh, for two years of his term, I was the Speaker of the House. This legislative branch is the first branch of government. The executive branch is the second branch of government. <laughs> <laughs> However, he's number one. The Vice President is number two. The Speaker is number three. But we all had a mutual respect uh, for what our, um, our responsibilities were and the roles that we played in all of that, including now as leader of the House Democrats. So uh, I think this president is a great president. I think that I don't want you to misunderstand what I say right now. He is very decent. He's smart, he's knowledgeable, he listens to other people, he accommodates their views. And then he projects his decency onto them when he comes to a compromise. Sometimes the other people don't receive that compliment the way they should. I mean, it's just, that's all I can say. He always thinks, like when last year when we had this, in our view, horror show, the tax stuff at the end of the year, when the tax cuts at the high end were renewed and even icing on the cake with um, uh, estate tax advantages even greater for the high end. We were like, well, lift the debt ceiling. We didn't like any of it to begin with, but at least lift the debt ceiling. I think that the president's view was the Republicans will act responsibly in the majority, projecting his decency on to some who saw things differently. Let's just put that <laughs> But he's great. He's great, and he will be reelected. And the campaigns are campaigns. It's a you know, it's it's the challenge that is out there. But I feel very confident about that. Uh, you know, the con conventional wisdom is that it, that in 2010, part of what happened was um, uh, the, the Democrats in the House who'd really carried a lot of water for him on on difficult votes, things like cap and trade. Um, Took took a bullet for him, um, and 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 I and some people have said to me that the White House didn't do enough to to help them to protect them, and and there even I've read I'm sure you have too many many people have suggested that that Obama likes to be seen as the kind of reasonable grown up, and that the 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 liberals in the House are sort of you know one squabbling faction and the Republicans in the House are the other squabbling faction and he likes to be seen as the peacemaker. Do you feel that um, he did enough for the Democrats who were up for re-election in 2010? And um, um, do you see him as that person who always wants to be in the middle? Well, let me say I have no complaint about where the president is and what his how he speaks out and what he believes in. Our members voted for what they believed in. If it also happened to be what the president believed in, mm -hmm. well, that was good. Could we have used a little more air cover? Yes. <laughs> but nonetheless, it, there was nothing that was made a difference. When you have 9.5% unemployment, which would have been 15% without the actions of President Obama, but nobody, again, wants to hear about what it would have been. Mm -hmm. If they don't have a job, it doesn't matter that more people wouldn't have had a job. They don't have a job. And it's a screen you cannot speak through. 
It's, it's just what it is. Nine and a half percent unemployment. No incumbents ever get elected to anything unless there's a clear, clear view of why we are there. But that would not have happened in the last election. So I, don't, I, 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 I have nothing but praise for the president in that regard. And again, the members voted for what people vote for what they believe in mm -hmm. at the end of the day. It, 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 that's why we have to weave the consensus uh, together that we do. As for this thing about the, the we are, our caucus, we've never lost a vote in our caucus. We're not squabbling. We always won. <laughs> We always want, because we work together to see where we could find our common ground. Uh, the, um, one of the things that happens now is that if you don't want anything to happen, the best thing to do is to make confusion reign. And that's really what's happening on the other side, the confusion about the role of government. And uh, so you don't talk about the role of government, you just say, we have a deficit. Well, we have, we have a deficit, and we all know that the deficit must be addressed. I'm a, grand, a, mother, a mom and a grandmother. I don't intend to pass on any private or public debts to my grandchildren. But if you look at this as just discussing the deficit, it's harder to understand what's going on. What's going on is that people are using the deficit as an excuse they're hijacking the legitimate fears of the American people that we all share about the size of the deficit. But they're using that as an excuse to destroy the public space. Clean air, clean water, food safety, public safety, public education, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. They want to do away with a government role. That's... that's who they are. Bless their hearts. That's what they believe. And they're true to that. But you have to understand that. Otherwise, you can't possibly say, well, why can't they find common ground on the deficit? Well, we could. We had to before. When President Bush won was president, we inherited the, the remains of that Reagan-Bush deficit. And President Clinton, and with the Democratic Congress, we passed our, our uh, budget bill. Many members lost their seats because of it. We lost the Congress, and that was one of the reasons, because it raised taxes. But it created, the, enabled the private sector to create 26 million jobs, took us on a path to fiscal recovery. In the last four uh, years of the uh, Clinton budgets were in balance or in surplus, taking us to a trajectory of $5.6 trillion dollars and surplus immediately turned around by President Bush when he came in, tax cuts for the high end, two unpaid for wars to give away to the pharmaceutical industry and to the billions and billions and billions of dollars. And there we are again, the biggest turnaround, $11 trillion swing in, fisc in the fiscal situation. And so here we are. If these people really cared about the deficit, where were they during the Bush years when this deficit was being developed? <laughs> So, so now we have a place where we have a debate not only about uh, investments and priorities, we have a debate about what the public role is. And all the time this debate is going on, we're not talking about jobs. Jobs, 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 which is the way to reduce the deficit because you bring revenue to the Treasury. Is that more on the subject than you wanted me to say? No, <laughs> it's great. It, I, I, I definitely wanted to get to the subject of the Republicans and how do you deal with this anti-government fervor that's out there? What is it? Is it something that Democrats can exploit? Um, do you see the kind of extremism taking over the party and is that potentially useful for the Democrats? Or um, I'm just curious about how, you know, what, what lines of attack or defense c take on this kind of uh, big government, you know, is bad? line that is all over the, the Republican uh, presidential debates, for instance, right now? Well, my daughter Alexandra, who is with me here today, said, Mom, when you talk politics, they're going to tune out. Just <laughs> tell them stories. <laughs> <laughs> so what story can I tell you about this? The, the, um, the budget is supposed to be, as I said earlier about the president, a statement of our national values. 
What is important to us as a nation should be reflected in our allocation of our resources and how we acquire those resources, how we invest them. We have a table of 12 people who are coming together, hopefully coming together, to address the budget situation. I don't think it should be about budget. I think it should be about jobs. How does a budget, how do you put together a budget that is a centerpiece of which is job creation, which brings re revenue again, revenue to the treasury to help reduce the deficit. And if your centerpiece is jobs, then you use the tax code accordingly and you use the investments or the cuts accordingly. And the timing of it all, so that the cuts you make are not destructive of the economic recovery uh, that is possible, however limited, but nonetheless on the right path. But uh, the Republicans have said they're not going to touch one hair, one hair on the head of people making over now, the president has said, a million dollars a year. <clears throat> I like the million dollar number. It has clarity. <laughs> one million dollars. You make, oh, make, not have, make one million dollars a year. Your first dollar over a million dollars, you pay a little more in taxes. You pay a little more for the defense of our country, the education of our children, the dignified retirement of our, our seniors. That's all a trust fund anyway over here. But nonetheless, people don't use it as an excuse to, uh, uh, to cut the deficit or cut uh, Social Security. So in any event, they have said, we're drawing a line in the sand. Even if you had $10 of cuts to $1 of taxes, we can't support that. People say to me, well, you, you, you have appointments to the committee. You draw your line in the sand. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. It's no use even going to the table. If they have a line in the sand and we have a line in the sand, we might as well all stay home. And that's not the right thing for the American people. We all know what our values are. We know our purpose. So we go to the table and try to figure this out if deficit reduction is what we have in mind. And so uh, we have to... I, said, I usually don't share what I say to the president, but what I do say to the president is, Abraham Lincoln said, public sentiment is everything. Public sentiment is everything. You have to take this to the public so they understand what is at stake. You can't have innovation unless you invest in education. You, you know, these things are all connected. More money comes from the tr to the treasury by investing in education than any other initiative that you can name. So cutting education is going to cut the deficit? Not at all. Not at all. It makes matters worse. So that's why there has to be something that the public is engaged in, understands what these choices are and what the impact uh, of them are, because we are at a very crucial time for our country. I happen to think, you know, during this so-called break that we took, vacation they call it, I tasked uh, my, my, my caucus, the House Democratic Caucus, and I decided that during this break we would communicate with as many small business owners as possible to, to present the president's jobs bill and to, to understand what's going to happen at that table. Because we believe that investments in small business, as does the president in his jobs bill, the spirit of innovation, Again, competitiveness for a country is what should drive what happens there. And so they'll come back having t spoken to thousands of small businesses, and that will continue in the couple of weeks ahead until we have to make those decisions at the table and then from there. But that's where uh, jobs are created and capital is formed and, and people reach their aspirations. It's about small business. It's not about giving tax breaks to the wealthiest people in our country. And to say that that is going to be job creation when it wasn't during the Bush years. Did you know, tell your friends, that during the second year of the Obama administration, more jobs were created in the private sector than in the eight years of the Bush administration at a time when they had tax cuts for folks at the high end. So again, these are important decisions. They are trivialized, trivialized by the confusion that people want to um, throw in because then it's harder, then it's a pox on all your houses. It's a strategy, it's a tactic, I guess it's both. It's a tactic, part of a strategy uh, to uh, keep um, 
uh, tax cuts in place for uh, those who mostly want to pay their fair share. And so we have to, we have to again, be even-handed at that table. The sense of fairness is a compelling American value. The American dream is the most compelling bonding issue that, that from one generation to the next, all of them are better served uh, by our, all of us pitching and making the cuts of producing the revenue, creating the jobs that will take us to this transformative place where everybody thinks that they have uh, a, a shot at the American dream. So. So such, that, that vision of a shared um, kind of sacrifice <coughs> and, and moving together work in the face of the argument that's coming from the Republicans on the Hill, which is class warfare. If you're going to raise um, taxes on millionaires, that's class warfare. And, and speaking of that, I also <laughs> want to <laughs> I'd like that. That has been the rallying cry. And, and it's coming a lot from um, the, the sort of the Tea Party caucus, which yeah. made me also want to ask you, who really is the leader on the Republican side? Is it Eric Cantor or is it John Boehner? Excuse me, my expression was not geared to you, Jane. Oh. <laughs> but this whole thing of class warfare, well, I, t my members who, I, I point three, Harry Reid points three, Rich McConnell points three, John Boehner, you know, House and Senate, Democrat, Republican, through this table of 12. Our caucus has said, you cannot go to that table without having right in front of your face the fact that 15% of the American people live in poverty, 15%. 22% of America's children live in poverty. 20, uh, about 20, it's about 40 some million people who live in poverty. 20 some of those million people, 20 million of those people live in extreme poverty, which means they live below 50% of the poverty line. What is going on here? We have wages not rising with productivity. We have equity going like this, these gaps in ownership and equity in our country. Something's wrong with this picture. When we became the majority, the first 100 hours, we passed the minimum wage increase. The first time in 11 years that had been increased, the first time in 11 years. What is, what kind of policy is that? So when they want to talk about class warfare, as Warren Buffett said, yeah, there was class warfare, and his class won. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, really, I mean, this is about our democracy. It's about a strong middle class. It's about fairness. It's about giving people a shot. There's no guarantee, but there's an opportunity that is, again, an overriding American value. So when they talk about class warfare, that is really, in my view, um, a, uh, a defense they know it is, and and why? I mean, one of the candidates for president, who shall remain nameless, said when they talked about corporations and, and taxes, and he said corporations are people too. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps I have news for him: workers are people too. So this isn't a. You know, we really, you know, we, we reward success. Got, got these pearl earrings. We reward for success. <laughs> we, it's, you know, it's, it, everybody is, uh, uh, strives for that, hopes for it, and the rest. God bless them for their success. God bless the shareholders who participate in that success. But let's not forget the workers who contributed to that success. And as long as productivity and wages continue to go like that, productivity up, wages not rising in any way in relationship to productivity, we're going to have an a, a, um, erosion of the middle class. We're going to have uh, people slipping down from it instead of their hopes and dreams of aspirations of being made. Most people in the country, no matter how poor they are, believe they are in the middle class. Uh, and that's where they want to be. And we have to honor that aspiration. So we think that um, they can say all they want about class warfare. Am I missing something here? Perhaps you'll tell me during the Q&A as to why that is an illegitimate charge in a country that has life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness as part of its founding documents and has fairness and opportunity as some of its uh, uh, guiding principles. 
Okay, since you have brought up the pearl earrings, um, <laughs> we need to get into the less stratospheric to the more sort of mundane. Uh, some of the questions I had were about things like, how do you manage to wear high heels for 25 years on those marble floors <laughs> in, the, in, the, in, in Congress? Don't your feet hurt? And do you think much about, as a woman, about what kind of image you need to project in order to be a perfect role model for all women? I wish I could say yes. One day I wore boots because it was uh, snowing out, and I walked into the marble carter and boom, fell right down. I thought, <laughs> so much for my rubber heeled sold boots. Uh, uh, no, I don't, I, don't know, I don't think that much about the heels that. Don't hurt. As I said to my husband the other day, they're always asking me how I des decide what I'm going to wear. It's usually the same as everybody else. What's clean? <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, um, in speaking of what's clean, it makes me think of the story about how you met your husband, um, which I thought was very charming. It's in your book, and, um, and I wondered sort of what kind of larger um, sort of uh, maybe message we could derive from it. Um, Nancy Pelosi was a student in college, I think, mm -hmm. and um, her husband, you were going to pick up some things from the dry cleaner. Oh, yeah. And your oh, yeah, husband, yeah. not yet husband, but this young man said, oh, I've got some things at the dry cleaner, too. Here's my slip. Could you pick them up for me? And she came back from the dry cleaner with her stuff, and he said, gee, I thought I had more shirts than that. And she said, oh, I totally forgot your stuff. And I wonder, is there a message which <laughs> <laughs> don't do their dirty work for them? No, I don't know, you know. But um, or he seems like he was the perfect choice. He's been a great partner. Yeah, he's but, lovely. And remember yeah. that after we were married, he gave me a shirt to iron, which I stuffed in a drawer someplace. I think we gave the bureau to Goodwill, and I don't know whatever happened to the shirt. So, <laughs> but um, no, my husband is lovely. We have five children. Uh, when um, we brought our baby Alexandra home from the hospital in California that week, she's number five. Our f oldest daughter uh, was turning six that week. So it was, God, it was, you know, Catholic. <laughs> Catholic. Five without, children Catholic, in six years. Five in six years. So I don't know how many days would go by where I wouldn't wash my face or anything. But once you're in school, you think you can do anything, right? You've managed. And that's why I say to young women and to, to moms, wear as a banner of honor the dipl diplomatic skills, the organizational skills, the engineering skills, the interpersonal skills, the, the everything that it takes to be a mom, even if it's one child or two children, well, five and six years, it's, it's, um, it's something. But, but uh, I mean, being a mom it, it, and being parents, moms and dads, it's really the most challenging wonderful, rewarding job in the world, but it is, uh, shall we say, constant. And uh, so once they, so when I, uh, when I got this opportunity, years now have gone by, I got the opportunity to run for Congress. A Congresswoman took ill and she wanted me to run in her place. I had never wanted to run for Congress. I came from a political family. My father, when I was born, my father was in Congress. When I went up, was in first grade, he was elected mayor of Baltimore, Thomas D'Alessandro. When I went away to college, he was still the mayor of Baltimore. <laughs> still the mayor of Baltimore. That was my whole life. Um, and so all I wanted to be was normal, like a normal teenager and a normal <laughs> this or that. I had no interest in running for public office. I had public service as a uh, value that our parents, we, you know, we had to make sure people knocked on the door. They, when I was a little girl, I could tell somebody how to get a bed in city hospital, uh, <laughs> how an uh, apartment in the city projects, how to get something to eat, how to get in or out of jail, whatever the case may be, um, <laughs> whatever, because I heard my mother say it so many times. And we had just a responsibility to the community. And when we did a favor for somebody, we expected them to do, pass it on, to do a favor for somebody else. So that was how I was raised. So I was always interested in helping people in politics. But I was the shy one. Six boys, one girl. You can just imagine the youngest, the attention. So I didn't want any attention. And, um, but then Saul Luck Burton, my, this beautiful, lovely woman who represented us in Congress, her husband, Philip Burton, had been the congressman, a powerhouse in the Congress, and then she succeeded him. 
So I went to Alexandra and I said, Alexandra, Daddy and I have talked about this. I have an opportunity to run for Congress. I've never had any desire to run for Congress or any public office, but I had this opportunity. Now, four of my children, our children were in college already. Alexandra was going to be a senior in high school. So I said, Alexandra, any answer is okay. I wish it were one more year later. It would be an easier decision for me. If you want me to stay home with you, um, that's a perfect answer. If not, I would be gone Monday through Thursday. But with all the sincerity and I could muster or had in my heart, Alexandra, whatever you want is a good answer for me. She looked at me and she said, Mother, get a life. <laughs> get a life. What teenage girl wouldn't want her mother gone for three days? Of <laughs> so I got another life, a congressional life, and went from the kitchen to the Congress and then later from being a homemaker to the House Speaker. And I want many more women to take that. And don't be deterred by their criticism. If you weren't effective, they wouldn't criticize you and go after you and the rest. So you get in the arena, you throw a punch, you take a punch. I know it's rough, but that's the way it is. But it is worth it because I view what I do as an extension of my role at work as a mom and a grandmother making the future, striving to make the future better for all children because the disparity Look at that, 22 million children in America living in poverty, some of them in extreme poverty, and the number is growing. We have, to, you know, we, we owe it to our founders, to our children, our founders' vision, our children's aspiration, the, our men and women in uniform who fight for our country's greatness uh, uh, to do our best to, to make the future better. However, we see that and can enlist the support of others uh, to do. So uh, it is... Um, uh, it's, we need many, many more women uh, in the kinds. For example, take this whole room. When I went to Congress, if you took this whole room, this how many women would be there? This first row and those three, just this many would be women, and everybody else would be men. Now it's, a li it's better than it was like 120th, now it's like one fifth, but we still I want women to... Uh, recognize how urgent it is because I believe, with all due respect to our gentlemen friends who are here, there's nothing more wholesome for the political process, for the governmental process, than the fuller participation of women uh, in that process. <laughs> can, can I ask you um, about whether you feel gender equality has really reached Congress and specifically one thing I wondered was, as we know, the the Republican speaker who is now in that job um, it f famously cries a lot. And um, <laughs> he has cried when he's lost votes. I don't think I remember you crying when you no. lost any votes. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, how do you think it would have gone over if you cried? Well, first of all, we didn't lose any votes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, can you just imagine? Can you just imagine? Well, I think things are getting better, to go to the first part of your question. When, um, it, it, I, I've written this book called Know Your Power for Women to Know Their Power and This That, but in it I tell this story. And I think it, I mean, maybe you tell me if you, what you think of it. So we were there in Congress, and again, there are like 20 of us out of 435 in the House. 435 out of 20 of us. On Tuesday nights, we used to go to dinner, some of us, our Tuesday night group. And there were three women, Barbara Boxer, are now our senator, but she was in the House then, Barbara Canelli from Connecticut, and I. We were three of the women, say it's a dozen or 15 all together. At these dinners, oh, we, well, it was just like everything else in Congress. Nobody ever asks you what you thought about anything. You just had to jump in, jump in, interrupt. It's hard when you go home after you've been doing that all week. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but so we're having this dinner, and we always laugh because they'd say, they'll never ask us what we think. No matter what, whether it's the economy, whether it's a war, whether it's this, whether it's that, whatever it is. Then it was the Central American War, way back when. So one night, we're having dinner, and they start talking about childbirth. 
the guys. <laughs> the guys, they're talking about childbirth. So we're looking at each other, the two of, the three of us are looking as if, surely they'll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll never forget my first. I went in there, had on the green gown, had the mask, had my camera, had that thing on my head. <laughs> I went in, I went in. Uh, it was all about him. Yeah, all about him. <laughs> you never know there was a mom and a baby involved. It was all about him. I saw what was going on. I got out of there right away. <laughs> and the next one goes in. I took all these pictures. I still have them. You want to see them? No. Uh, but they all go in about what their great moment was in that grant gown with that thing, with that hat and that camera and the whole thing and how it was and what the doctor's philosophy was with the first one versus the second one. And we're thinking, you know what? We're having dinner. We don't even want to talk about childbirth, <laughs> <laughs> having been there ourselves for the whole thing. And, <laughs> and but surely they'll say, is this an uncomfortable conversation for you? <laughs> or what do you think? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Zero. But we were not going to let them off the hook. We just let it decide. So a week later, we're at dinner again and this beautiful man who used to be a member of Congress, Don Edwards, he was the floor leader for the ERA. He was one of the biggest feminists in, in Congress, a lovely, lovely civil libertarian anyway. We're talking about something and he says, Nancy, what do you think? And I said, well, blah, 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 this is what happened last week, boop, 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 the whole thing. Can you believe these guys? And thank you for asking what I think. Those same people were at the table and they said, we never did that. So not only did they not have a clue, they didn't have a clue that they didn't have a clue. <laughs> we would never have done such a thing. Imagine to have a full-fledged conversation about childbirth and never say to a woman there, does this make you uncomfortable or how was it for you uh, in terms of having a baby? But I thought if they're not asking us about this subject, what on earth makes us think they're going to ask us about a declaration of war, uh, an increase in taxes, or you know whatever else comes along? We just had to sort of make our own way on it. But that's the way power is. Nobody ever gives it away. You have to contend for it, fight for it. And that's why um, when I was in Congress, I had n no intention of running for Congress, but I had no intention of running for leadership once I got there, until we lost in 94, 96, 98, 2000, 2002, I thought, you know what, I know how to win elections. I'm not gonna wait around for somebody to ask me because they never do. We just made our push and then we won in 2006, bringing everybody together in a bit of a different way. And women have a way of doing that, consensus builders, with all due respect to great leaders that we have. <laughs> That's a great story. Mm -hmm. Well. I, it, it does make me wonder when they, we, you know, there's a, a new book that came out recently, uh, Ron Suskind wrote it, that describes, I think it quotes Anita Dunn from um, the Obama White House saying that it's a boys club down there. And I wondered if you had found that, but also the context seemed to be missing. Has it ever not been a boys club? I don't know, in the, in the in, you know, has it been... Is it, it was, is it different now than it was and, um, when, as a woman dealing with this White House? Any different from, say, what it was like in the Bush 1, Bush 2, Clinton? Maybe Clinton. I don't, I don't know. I don't, don't, don't want to know the answer there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that... I, I, I haven't read the book, A, B. I don't, haven't spoken to Anita Dunn about it, but I don't think that... Um, well, I'm talking to the present legislative branch Article 1 of the Constitution, Executive Branch, Article 2. And, and President Bush used to even say to me, I'm one, he's two, you're three. You know, <laughs> when we would have our conversation, they all knew that the Speaker of the House, as a woman, had a very important place in, the, in both places, and now even as leader. But um, uh, in, in, uh, obeying my daughter, I'll tell you this story. So I get elected to be the leader of the Democrats. Now, now I'm going to make my mark about go out, win the elections, and win the majority, and then become speaker. But nonetheless, it didn't matter that I was speaker. What mattered to me was that the American people would win when the Democrats won, if I'd be meant, allowed a moment of po political uh, indulgence. So anyway, this isn't that moment. 
<laughs> so get invited to my first meeting as a leader in the Democrats. So I go to the meeting, and I've been to the White House a million times as an appropriate member of the Appropriations Committee, as intelligence uh, uh, committee person, and this and that. So I didn't even give it a thought. I had no apprehension at all. I thought, I'm going to a meeting at the White House. So I go to the meeting at the White House. As the door closed behind me, I realized this was unlike any other meeting I had been at the White House. In fact, it was unlike any meeting any woman had ever been to at the White House because I was going to sit down at that table with my legitimacy springing from a, a, my hundred, couple hundred members electing me to be there. Certainly women have sat at the cabinet table at the appointment of the president. And, you know, at that table, one vote counts. Uh, I was coming in a different way. When I say in my own right, in my own right as leader of our caucus, not my legitimacy and uh, being derived from the person at the head of the table. So we go in there, and President, uh, President Bush is a very gracious man. He, um, Alexander did a movie about him, but get, <laughs> very gracious, welcoming, welcome. Oh, we can't wait to hear what you have to say. I'm sure it'll be different, ha, 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 than some of the things the rest of us have to say. <laughs> but as he was talking, and then we start, he started to go into the legislative agenda he wanted. I feel the whole chair closing in on me. I'm just like, the whole chair, it was like, people were sitting here and here and here all over. It was just packed and jammed on that chair. And I don't know what he was thinking because I was out of focus as far as he was concerned. Well, that was not an unusual thing, but in any event, <laughs> I feel that I have Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Alice Paul, Lucretia Mott, Sojourner Truth, they're all sitting there on the chair with me. This never happened to me before or since. <laughs> and I could hear them say, at last we have a seat at the table. And then they were gone. And my thought was, we want more. <laughs> we want more. But imagine, so you think, you think of the shoulders that women stand on, of those women who fought so hard, left their homes at a time when it was unthinkable, unladylike, whatever they tried to characterize it, for them to go out there and fight over 150 years before for a woman uh, to have the right to vote. And it took a long time. Actually, it was only 91 years ago when we got the right to vote, but their struggle began almost 90 years before that. And then you realize that other women will be standing on your shoulders, and we have to keep opening doors of participation to women. So when you ask um, about their attitude toward women, and it doesn't happen with me. I, um, um, because I come in not just as a woman, but I come in fully backed by my caucus. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would think that generationally with this president, I, I have never seen anything but respect from him and his people for women. I don't know the book. I, I can't imagine, well, I don't know what um, Anita said about that, but uh, if, in fact, any of them have that issue, it's their problem because it's over. It's over. I mean, really, women have asserted themselves as Hillary Clinton ran for president with such dignity, with such intelligence, with such stamina, with such astuteness. I mean, we just have to keep this thing going for women because it's really very important for our country. And if anything indicates to me that uh, uh, hope on this is that when I became whip, first I was whip, then leader, then speaker, the mail that I received from fathers of daughters, fathers of daughters now, was so encouraging. Thank you for what this means to my daughter. I see in her all the personality and this or that and this or that. So when fathers of daughters are saying that, I think that's pretty, moms always know. And by the fathers of daughters saying that, I thought that was really great. And you have to remember, I was raised a long time ago in a very, uh, strict Italian American family, very progressive in our politics, very conservative in our upbringing, 
We were devoutly Catholic, deeply patriotic. Um, well, I have to say, proud of our Italian-American heritage, very proud of that, and I have to say, staunchly democratic. So that was the upbringing, but it wasn't anything that said little girls can go do anything they set out to do. It was another, I mean, it was a zillion years ago, but now dads, not, prote not necessarily not protecting their daughters, but uh, the roots and wings that we want all little girls and little boys uh, to have. I don't think that that happens at the White House. I mean, that would, A, not be my experience, not be what I would project onto them, seeing them mm -hmm. in many mm -hmm. uh, settings. Mm -hmm. um, well, looking for, look forward towards 2012, um, I want to take some questions in a minute, but I just was curious about um, what you think might be possible in terms of the Democrats' uh, prospects for taking back the House and, um, it looked like to me there were something like two dozen seats. Is that right? And, twenty-five. Mm -hmm. And um, twenty-five. <laughs> <laughs> and but who's counting? Um, me. And, <laughs> I'm counting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, I I it, I, I remember in the the main analysis for 2010 was the problem was the economy and yeah. there's still employment over 9%. So yeah. what can you hope for? What do you think is realistic? And how do you do it? Okay, now we're talking politics now. I mean, is that allowed at the and then back, New Yorker and then festival? Yeah. <laughs> then I'll tell you my favorite New Yorker cartoon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we... Uh, comes down to numbers. First of all, let me say that I believe that once the president is more out there, as you see, he's out there now, public sentiment is everything, Abraham Lincoln, uh, that uh, there'll be a clear understanding as to what the choice is. I think the president has excellent prospects to be reelected because he's great. Uh, we don't know who the opponent will be, and that's up, up to the Republican Party. But I believe he will win because I believe in his vision for America, uh, that when he goes out there and talks about the greatness of our country, our values, not issues, issues divide, values unite, the values of the education of our, our children, the economic, uh, the uh, uh, retirement security of our seniors, the creation of jobs, the protection and safety of our neighborhoods and, and clean environments in which our kids can live, a world at peace in which everyone can thrive and our security all done in a fiscally sound way. That's nothing partisan about any of that, I don't think. And that common ground can be achieved at the higher ground of values rather than at the bean counting, accounting ground down here. So once we agree on our values, then we can decide how we allocate our resources. And I believe that he will make that case uh, because I know what's in him to do that, and we have seen. In terms of the House of Representatives, <clears throat> let me, uh, since we're talking politics, in the first um, in the two years when we were in, in power, when the president was in power, and by the way, we got a number of good things accomplished under President Bush. We passed the biggest energy bill ever passed. It wasn't the climate change bill, but it was an energy bill that was of huge consequence, raised the uh, emission standards for the first time in 32 years, did historic things uh, excellently. We worked with him on a number of issues. But when we had a Democratic president, we had uh, more things that we could get done, starting with raising the minimum wage. So for the two years, you have bookends of the first bill he signed, Lilly Ledbetter, to end discrimination in the workplace for women. And one of the last bills he signed the ending discrimination in the military, the repeal of don't ask, don't tell. And everything in between, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and everything in between was about expanding liberty and opportunity. That's what our country has always been about, more opportunity, whether it was the freedom that the health care bill gave you or with the uh, uh, Wall Street reform bill, the biggest, the greatest consumer protections in the history of our country. Regulatory reforms, yes, first time in decades in the history of our country for uh, uh, issues that relate to national service, Ryan White Care, 
a hate crimes bill that was fully inclusive uh, to protect the American people against hate crimes. But everything was about giving people more freedom, less discrimination. And again, uh, the, you know, if you want me to, I'll go into more detail about all this. But it was every other week a bill signing of celebratory nature of something great for our country, was the Edward Kennedy National Service Bill for volunteerism, you name it. In the first nine months of this year, the president hasn't had any celebratory bill signings. He had two budget bills, which were, in my view, unacceptable, but had to pass. And I think a, pen, a, a controversial patent bill I didn't vote for it, but, but some people did. Enough did. But nonetheless, nothing. Three bills. Nothing. And for the next 14 months, more of the same. It's going to be a presidency and a Congress that has missed the opportunity to make progress for the American people. So if we don't win, there'll be two more years of a president, I'm assuming that he wins, of not getting anything accomplished for the American people. We just can't afford that. The world is not waiting for us to catch up in terms of our competitiveness and our investments in science, 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 and science. Right now, when the Republicans were in power and President Bush was in power, it was faith or science. Take your pick. <laughs> you can't have both. We say science is an answer to our prayers. <laughs> in fact, I just said that at St. Patrick's Cathedral earlier this morning. <laughs> but the, but the, so the thing is, is what, you know, what, what is the opportunity that is missed for our country? So that's why not only is it necessary from my standpoint politically for the president to be reelected, but for there to be a democratic house of representatives uh, so that we can accomplish something. So we need 25 votes. 61 seats, again, stop me if it's more than you want to know. 61 seats are held by Republicans right now were carried by President Barack Obama. Of those 61, 16 were also carried by John Kerry. Say we win 10 of those. I think we win them all, but conservatively, say we win 10 of those. The 45 that are remaining, give them 25, we'll take 20. <laughs> we're already over the 25 that we need now. I don't expect that they'll win that many, but speaking for this one time, conservatively, that <laughs> we have some, our eye on some seats that were not carried by President Obama but are held by Republicans where there's some ethical and other challenges to the candidate uh, there. So we believe that it would be easier for us to win 25 seats than it was last year to hold 63 seats. That's how many we lost. To hold 63, you have a big, heavy lift. To win 25, you can select your races more carefully because you don't have to defend uh, every seat that you have to defend. So don't tell anybody I told you that, but that's a secret plan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, we feel that what is happening, as it turns out, the nuns used to say this to us, what, what, you, what you are speaks so loudly, I cannot hear what you say. That's what the nuns used to say at the Institute of Notre Dame in Baltimore, Maryland. What the Republicans are doing speaks so loudly as to who they are that it speaks more clearly than anything that we could say in contrasting what we want to do to them. Privatizing Social Security, voucherizing Medicare, block granting Medicaid for those things, tax cuts for the high end, not wanting to invest in science and technology. I think I'm getting a little too political here. <laughs> but in any event, um, uh, I only mention that because the response that we have received in terms of the caliber of candidate who wants to run, really wants to make the fight for the American people, the financial resources that are flowing to us, we outraised the Republicans for the first eight months of this year, which is incredible. And, um, and the contrast and the issues. And our focus is going to be standing tall for small, for small businesses, for people who need to aspire to the middle class, but also uh, to re reward success and do it all in a way uh, that is fiscally sound, grows the economy, creates jobs, protects our environment, 
and uh, invest uh, in our children, their education, and their future. So we feel pretty good about it. Great. Um, I guess that there should be microphones out there for people who want to ask questions. Um, remember, please make it a question, not a statement or an argument. Um, and well, they can have an argument <laughs> after the mm -hmm. answer, maybe. Um, okay. Okay. We so. got a lot of people standing up or wow. are leaving. Okay. <laughs> wow. But, um, we have to go at a clip. So, all right. Um, uh, we'll start on the left for a change. Okay, over here. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm a family physician, and thank you for everything you've done to thank address you. inequities in health care. But I do have to comment, excuse me, just in framing my question, it has to be a comment first, that many physicians are really um, afraid of some components of the Affordable Care Act particularly the so-called accountable care organizations, which haven't been very well defined yet by Congress and right. the regulations haven't been written. Right. We've also been told that the way physicians and healthcare organizations may be paid under the Affordable Care Act has something to do with capitated lives, which means that there's a big push for huge corporate organizations Right. I need to just, what's okay. the question? The yeah. question is, what's going to protect patients from being able to choose their own physicians? Well, that is a fundamental point of the Affordable Care Act, that if you like your physician, you can keep your physician. We have work to do that, that we haven't finished on the uh, SGR, I mean, to be technical, that we must, and we at that table of 12, must uh, deal with that. The uh, issue, uh, some of the issue, we fought very hard for the family physician part of it, for primary care doctors, for loan forgiveness for docs who go into uh, for uh, our primary care. And, uh, and so when those regulations come forth, you have to be, uh, I'm barraged by these kinds of things, and I pass them on to the administration that will be writing the rules, the Institute of Medicine is making not one but two studies in this regard, so you have to weigh in on that. But the, the end of the day, the overriding principle is that, um, uh, that the uh, people will be able to keep their physicians. Thank you. Over here. Yeah, Thank my you. question was uh, faith in government and uh, faith in Congress is at an all-time low. So you mentioned this vision that President Obama has. Um, why isn't that getting through to the American people and why do you think anything is going to change in two years if he does get reelected? I think that he's going to be out there more making the case and now I think he's going to have to uh, because this is a, a, a time of define or be defined and you know the other side is not bashful about definitions of true or false uh, so uh, the, the fact is that I think he knows that this is what has to happen now. It's not just about his re-election. And believe me, I wish that the elections were that weren't that important, that we had more in common. But this is a How many times have you heard people say, this is the most important election of our time? <laughs> well, they just keep getting more important. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think he sees that it's not just about his re-election, which he could probably take a path of least resistance and win. It's about defining why you want to be president and what that means for the future. But you're absolutely right. Unless he does that, people won't know. You cannot assume that they do. But thank, and thank you for your question. Uh, on health care, now that coverage has been expanded, what needs to be done to responsibly bring costs under control? Well, the, this is really important because I said to you before, cost containment was one of the motivating factors for getting this done. And uh, what we did institute directly in the bill, cut a half a trillion dollars out of cost at, at, at Medicare, uh, got criticized for it, said we were cutting benefits, not so. It was just a way to make the, uh, the system stronger without cutting benefits. But as I mentioned earlier, the Institute of Med Medicine study, there's an iPad, this board uh, that is studying how to bring costs down. But the goal of it 
and thank you for your question. The goal of it is to say we're not going to bring costs down really and improve quality unless we have value, not volume of procedures as a measure of how much good care you're getting. About quality of, of, of uh, care, not quantity of procedures. About measuring how well a, a, a system is working, a physician is working, not by his readmissions to the hospital, but how we can keep people at home and have the care they need. And if I were starting from scratch with no system in place, we'd be focusing a whole lot more on community health centers, which have proximity to where people are, uh, culturally appropriate, and with the one thing that we started even before the health care bill, uh, the health IT, electronic medical records, which follow a person every place. Uh, and so um, uh, health IT will bring costs down. Again, uh, the biggest obstacle to our passing the health care bill was none of this death panels and all that stuff. It was regional disparities in, in compensation. Florida and San Francisco, or I proud, which I proudly our performance was high, our compensation was low. In some places in the country, it's just the reverse. And we have to make sure that that is not the case. But this has to happen if we're going to really have the bending of the curve, whatever term you want to use on it. But it is a decision that has been made. Now, one of the things that our friends on the other side of the aisle have said is they want to get rid of that board that's going to get rid of the, the cost containment. I don't know how you figure that. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Hi. With politics becoming more and more partisan because the Republicans more and more are laying down their line in the sand, what is the hope for any bipartisan coming together in the future? I had heard that leaders in Congress used to sit down from both sides and have lunch together, and that doesn't happen as much. Where is their hope? That lunch thing is an overrated deal. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the fact is, is there are many Republicans I would probably rather have lunch with than some of my Democratic colleagues, because <laughs> we have, you know, we talk about our grandchildren and the rest. But um, the, uh, the fact is, is that uh, we have a responsibility to try to find common ground. When I came to Congress now, 24 years ago, um, I didn't come to be a Democrat. I came to be a member of Congress to work for the American people. Again, I'm staunchly democratic and, and want to help influence the decisions in that way, but not with the thought that everything's going to go the way I want it to go. But so you have a responsibility to the public to try to find common ground. But when you can't, you must stand your ground because there are big differences between the parties. They really are. And that's why I said you can't have the debate down here. You have to take it to a higher ground of values. And the only place that debate can take place and be a winning one for the American people is as broadly as possible uh, in the public domain. Yes, they talk about, you know, we're not, uh, we don't ignore each other. I mean, we, you know, just like gorillas in the mist, you nod to each other as a, <laughs> <laughs> you passed another human being and you respect that. But it is, um, uh, it, it isn't, it, in the 90s is when it really changed to a kind of an anti, a more politics of personal destruction when they went after President Clinton in the way they did and the reaction we had in Congress to that and the way they go after President Obama now. Never before has a president had to go $1.2 trillion in cuts in order for the full faith of credit of the United States of America to be upheld. What is this? You know, over and over again, these uh, holding him to to a different place. Uh, it's a it's the issue we have to deal with. But you know what? We just have to deal with it and respect the fact that the public deserves and expects better. That's why I think it's really important for us to put forth our democratic agenda in the clearest possible way, and then let them put their agenda in the clearest possible way and see what happens. It's that confusion that is an agent for uh, a disenchantment on the part of the American people and the fact that people do not have jobs, do not have jobs. But sometimes those lunches get overestimated. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hi, you said you supported um, science. This is an, yeah. an administration that appreciates science, but I have a question about the science coming out of the Department of Education. None of the mandates in Race to the Top are scientifically based. They are antithetical to the Institution of Education Sciences research and all of higher education research. And my question is, um, Mr. Duncan, Secretary Duncan has been, has ignored voices of educators and he was actually appointed in place of an expert female educator. At what level do you think this might be a gender issue? Oh, I don't think it's a gender issue and I think that what you have said is, is a point of view and there are other points of view. Uh, I would like to know what your point of view is though on the waiver that the president is putting forth now to accommodate uh, uh, more discretion at the state level in terms of meeting standards uh, and the rest and, and uh, relating to teachers. It's, this is a highly controversial issue as, as you can tell by the, uh, uh, the question. The, way, the, the waiver that he's putting forth right now is, is a quid pro quo for states that have not adopted race for the top and it's really not addressed the excessive and fr I'm going to tell you fraudulent use of standardized testing mm -hmm. for children in every grade level across all subjects. Yeah. And so it's really more of a, a, a window dressing fix. Uh, it is removing that cap for the 2014 100% um, yeah. um, uh, goals that had to be met. I mean, it's a goal that's unattainable. I mean, no, yeah. no yeah. one attains a 100% goal. I mean, you can't ask the police department to say, yeah. Okay, you'll lose your jobs if 100% of, of crime is eliminated. Yeah. That's essentially what that's, that goal meant. Yeah. But as far as the rest of the money, it's still being, has strings tied to it that are emphasizing excessive standardized testing and privatization of our public school system. Well, I travel all over the country and I try to visit uh, schools when I do, you know, when, when they're in session, et cetera. And so I hear what you say in varying degrees. That is to say, some schools are trying really hard and they're making progress, but they haven't met the standard. And then the parents get a letter that this school is no longer going to. And, and we've reported all of that back. It, it, some, uh, we have an expression, the plural of anecdote is not data, but we have enough, data, uh, uh, enough, enough experience uh, to say that this has to be done differently. Excuse me, and I don't mean to interrupt, but what, the data wait, is wait, wait, solid. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, we've got no, no, but it's a, it's a matter of opinion. It's no, it's a matter of opinion. I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying. I'm just saying the president is committed to race to the top, and we've tried to show them by example enough illustrations of how uh, this is unfair to certain, uh, to many circumstances, and they've come back uh, with this waiver. Uh, I'll, I'll be interested to see how it works, and I will take your concerns uh, back with you. I have, with me. Being, um, I have to be the bad cop. I see the stage manager saying, one more question. Oh. So. <laughs> Maybe they I'm all sorry. have the same question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to be shorter in my answer, and maybe that will... Uh... Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, I'm a voter from Philadelphia, so it's not about New York City only. Uh, well, uh, our Republican friends, uh, they're very vocal, spreading all kind of lies and misinformation, blatant lies about Social Security, Medicare, Some. and other things. All. Uh, <laughs> we all hear about... I'm uh, trying, I'm yeah, trying. <laughs> we, we all hear about uh, all this uh, mad dog tea parties uh, screaming everywhere, cuts, cuts, yeah, cuts, to the point that... Uh, uh, even some prominent Democrats now say that everything is on the table, complete outrage. So uh, why don't we see and hear some Democrats like yourself uh, speaking with passion and conviction? You see, we cannot get enough of you tonight, uh, today. Uh, why are you so gun-shy about presenting the liberal case? Because I believe people would be open to do this. Where are the graces of the Congress? I appreciate your question. Um, let me say this. Uh, we think we're making the case in our individual districts because that's where we serve. Uh, a lot of the effort that we make for uh, winning elections is in, are in places that are, shall we say, more conservative than here. That's where we have to pull people up. But in, 19, in 2005, when I made our effort to win the House, we, knew a, we went to the private sector 
and we said, forget the political consultants. If you're number two and you want to be number one, I don't know who's number one, Advil, Tylenol, one of those, but say you're one of those and you want to be number one, what would you do? And they basically gave us a plan. This is how we do it in the private sector. This is how we measure uh, our, the, the marketing aspects of this. You have to be know who you are. So that takes time to make sure everybody puts their priorities in order. Because if you had, uh, uh, if I had a couple hundred of my members in the room and asked for priorities, we'd probably have at least a couple hundred. So we have to get that down to a few, which we called our six for oh six in two thousand and six. Uh, prioritize, differentiate from the Republicans, take them down, and, and I don't mean to say that in a, uh, in a uh, way it affects the American people, but take down their things that they're out there saying, you know, do, uh, undermine the credibility of what they say when they do that, and, uh, and then come out with what you are pointing for. So we were the voice. The point being of that is we were the voice. There was a Republican in the White House, a Republican Senate, a Republican House. The House Democrats were the voice. And we went out there, went after President Bush for trying to privatize Social Security, did our plan, and we won. And we were united, and the senators joined us in this too. We were united. We made our plan, narrowed it down because you could have a mountain of nuggets, but what are your five or six that you're going to make your case on? Now it's different for us. We have a president in the White House. We have a president in the White House. The American people want to know what does the president think when they talk about the Democrats. They don't say the Republicans are saying this. What do the House Democrats think? They want to know what the president thinks. Or they want to know if we're in agreement with him. Or if we put something out there, they want to know what he thinks about it. What about me? What do you think? You know, what does he think about what we're talking about? So it's a different role for us. But our members know what they believe in and what they fight for in their districts and those who are running what they will fight for. He's going out there now. We are very pleased at how he is going out there in a very strong way. I think that was essential for him to do. And he shall we say, uh, frustration you may have felt about it, I hear all over the country. So now he's pivoted, he's in the mode, he's, he's out there to, to make the distinction. What's his vision? How does he differ from the other? What is at stake in this election? I have every confidence that we couldn't be better served than by his being out there, but I have every uh, assurance from my members that in the districts that we have to win, we will be making uh, our, own, our own case to the American people. But the, the message, we are, again, putting together our priorities in the House. We will be announcing our priorities, which are in sync with what the President is saying, but we're not taking anything for granted in that regard. We know what it takes to win. We intend to do it again. Now let me tell you about this New Yorker cartoon. <laughs> Have any of you sent in your, uh, your in the contest? Well, you, you know, they have a contest, every magazine with a, a cartoon with no caption, and you're supposed to send in what your caption is. Um, I know that our time is over, or else I, I would not have taken the time during our, our discussion. So about 30 years ago, I met Bill Hamilton, who did the, Na I think it's called Now Society or something like that. He did the cartoons in the New Yorker. And I said, you had the best cartoon I ever saw. I'm a cat, uh, chocolate ice cream aholic. I just, I'd, <laughs> I'd rather not eat any food at all, just eat chocolate ice cream all the time. So <laughs> he has a cartoon. Can you believe this? Two people are sitting at a table. They have cartons of chocolate ice cream in front of them chocolate, it says on the cartoon, on the boxes. They're sitting there. And one says to the other, will finding the best chocolate ice cream really make us better people? <laughs> so I told him that. He said, you know, I said, that's my favorite of all your cartoons. He said, that's the least I had any confidence in. <laughs> so there you are. But in any event, thank you, New Yorker Festival, for thank giving you. us the opportunity. And thank, thank you, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.